We'll call the, uh, the California board meeting to order. First order of business is a roll call. Uh, Scott Edson. Here. Uh, Pat Malin's here. Uh, Jason Akbari. Spot for him? No. We knew you weren't going to be. We didn't oh, think Jason was going to be here. Yeah. Come on up. Yeah, you can. Either there or here. And Nathan's on his way. He's, okay. Uh, accidentally went to headquarters and started Okay. <laughs> uh, Jeff Hunter. Uh, Sheriff Jim Mele. Scott Howland. Here. Chief Tarawanich. He's on his way. Uh, Chief Kevin Guerrero, present. <clears throat> Bill Hartley, here. Barry Frazier, present. Adelina Zendejas, here. And Jeff Lee, here. Uh, first order of business is well, first off, I would like to uh, recognize uh, one of our members who is going to be departing to um, bigger and better things. And Adelina Zendejas is uh, moving on to be Deputy Director of. Um, what? Uh, the Census, Census 2020 California Complete, Complete Count, I wow. believe is the actual name. Mm -hmm. So that will, um, so unfortunately we're going to lose her services, but we do, would like to recognize you and thank you so much for everything that you've done with us for the past several years and your contributions to this first net effort have been phenomenal. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I've truly enjoyed working and getting to know all of you. And I'm sure that you <clears throat> will have another great representative from the department and you will continue to do great things and I will be tracking. So I'm excited to see where we move forward with California. So thank you. Uh, next order of business is approval of the minutes from December 6, 2017. Are there any corrections? Is there a motion to approve? I'll make the motion. Scott. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, all the, I see, uh, I guess we have to do a roll call. So Scott Edson? Yes. Uh, Pat Mellon, yes. Um, Chief, Chief Howland? Yes. Uh, Chief Guerrero? Yes. Bill Hartley? Yes. Barry Frazier? Yes. Helena Zentejas? Yes. And Jeff Lee? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Next item up is the AT&T presentation. Do we have one? Here's a microphone. Hey, I'm sorry, he's got one right, right there. <clears throat> okay, hi, Barb Wynn, AT&T External Affairs. Thank you for the opt-in, the end of December of the state of California. Um, we are very, very excited and happy working very closely with OES. We've had multiple meetings with them on the plan for the state and we're excited about moving forward. Um, we did get approval on the first initial sites to build out. Uh, I wanted to give more specifics, um, um, but we'll brief each of the board members individually. We'll send something to you in writing on our build plan and where we stand. Um, we've worked really hard on the band 14 in 17 in hopes that we would get the opt-in. So we are moving um, forward very quickly on um, getting those sites um, moving forward. So I wanted to give you that update. Uh, we continue to work with Department of Technology and Cal OES on the pricing for the procurement vehicle for California so we can get people on the first net network. So, um, and we'll continue to work with them. We don't have another meeting scheduled yet, but it's coming soon, I'm sure. And we'll um, be able to give you more details at the next board meeting. And then just wanted to open it to see if you guys had any questions. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, please uh, let the record show that uh, Sheriff Melee has uh, arrived. <coughs> so thank you, Sheriff. <clears throat> Are there any questions for AT&T at this point? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the broadside broadband services update and Mr. Courier. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna give a, a brief update on 
What Cal OES has been doing, um, this is going to dovetail right in with um, some of the information that, that Barb just shared from AT&T. So um, there's copies of the presentation on the table there if you need one, and of course it'll be on the screens. So this is a, a brief overview. Um, we've got a graphic to connect the technology together. We'll give an update on FirstNet, and then there's some other slides for later agenda items uh, on this uh, topic slide as well. So this first graphic is a little hard to see, both in print and uh, on the screen, but it is on our website. The purpose of this is to let you know that we've, um, uh, we're letting you know who is the point of contact for anything related to either NextGen 911 and 911 or FirstNet and broadband services. So if you look on this chart over on this side, those are the broadband services um, that are part of the 911 branch under myself reporting up to Pat. And so we've broken out each of the counties to have a point of contact for each county, and they're listed on this graphic. And then if you want to get alignment with 911 and what's going on there, the 911 advisors are in the center of this graphic, so you know who your 911 advisor is as well as who your broadband services advisor is. So that's the purpose of this graphic with points of contact, emails, telephone numbers, and again, it's, it's on our website, uh, so you can download it. This next graphic is something that we put together to help decision makers understand how the different technologies fit together. So uh, one thing that I've been talking a lot about is Next Generation 911. Next Generation 911 is focused on getting the information from those who need help to those who provide the help. It's basically what 911 is do, uh, the Next Gen 911 is doing. So you see on the left-hand side of this diagram, these are the various ways that you can access 911 today. And the Next Gen 911 network will carry that uh, via IP connection to a public safety answering point. And it's there where it interfaces with the uh, customer premise equipment to handle the call and then process the call. The next piece of the puzzle is the radio interface. So LAN mobile radio is what we use for public safety communications. And this is, provides mission critical voice for public safety responders. And so that information is, is in most cases, comes uh, from the cu customer premise equipment over to the LAN mobile radio system and then is communicated for dispatch purposes. FirstNet, which we've been talking about, is primarily focused on the link from computer-aided <coughs> dispatch out to the emergency responders. Now, there's a rich applications data set that can also run across FirstNet uh, to provide some additional information, but FirstNet is, is primarily focused and broadband services are primarily focused on interfacing data to the public safety responders out in the field, whether that's police, fire, EMS, or into the extended primary users, back into the CAD, which is where the computer-aided dispatch, where that information resides. The other piece of this puzzle is the alert and warnings. Alert and warnings are generally controlled at the local level, so there's some local authority. Sometimes that local authority is extended into the public safety answering point. <laughs> Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's an emergency uh, operations center or somebody in their emergency management staff. And then those warnings come back out and are sent essentially out to the same devices that are used to access 911, but they're sent out through a different path, which is really important to understand. Even uh, there's a brand name called Reverse 911, which would seem to imply that it traverses backwards through the 911 path, but it does not. It's, it's following a different path out. So it's, it's important to understand how these technologies interact one with another and how there's an integration required between them. So obviously, what's important to us is the link between NextGen 911 and FirstNet. So this graphic, uh, which was adapted from the National Association of 911 Administrators and the National Emergency Number Association. And we kind of tweaked it and put a California flavor on it. And what we're focusing in on here is this portion of the diagram where you see the, the various data coming into the public safety answering point or the NextGen 911 call center. That's the path that NextGen 911 is going to solve for us. There's a critical integration that has to happen between that data and, and FirstNet so that we can then send that information out to the public safety responders on this side of the diagram. That next-gen 911 to FirstNet integration is something that's very important uh, and is something that has to be yet developed. So this graphic also shows kind of a current state of where we are. FirstNet today is offering priority and uh, preemption 
as well as some, some other features. And this next list is really a, a, a concise <laughs> list of what Cal OES has been working with AT&T to implement. Some of these become available when the FirstNet core is online in April, and others are going to take longer to implement. And these are really just a concise summary of some of the um, some of the information that was in the letter that we sent back to FirstNet and AT&T when we opted in. All right, so any questions on that from the board before we go on this kind of a technology overview? Budge, I have just a quick comment. Uh, so I've been working with the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council on Internet of Things for Public Safety. There will be another box that I think the, the PSAP Comm Center will have uh, important input or uh, important role in, and that is going to be managing the data that will begin coming in from sensors and alarms and <laughs> other types of non-human sources. Uh, we've been looking at this, and you know, the obvious and most logical place for this information to become managed and to be fed back out to first responders is going to be the PSAP. So at some point, I would expect to see another box here that includes uh, non-human communications from, from sensors and, and data sources and those types of things. It, the, the reason I bring it up is just going to bring another um, work task for PSAP operators and, and the managers, they're going to have to figure out how to also incorporate the Internet of, Internet of Things data into their overall, the overall flow chart. So just pointing that out is something that probably in the future you may need to look at. Yeah, and that's something, Barry, that was discussed at uh, 911 Goes to Washington, and Nina is, is taking that up, and I know APCO is also addressing that. And so that data management, who does it, what does that look like, is, is certainly a, a question. But to your point, I think it's important to understand the data integration itself will, will more than likely occur at the 911 center. Yeah. It's going to have to occur there because that's where all the other equipment resides. So now there's just going to be a management of operational practices linking together what the technology is, is going to uh, be able to provide. So, yeah, good point. Any other comments or questions on that? Hey, Budge, in your analysis, have, uh, have, is there any indication that PSAPs are going to need more resources? <laughs> we, uh, we <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the short answer is yes, but that didn't come from our analysis. That's, that's work really that uh, Nina and APCO have been doing a lot uh, in that space, as well as the, uh, the NASNA, the National Association of 911 Administrators. So it's a conversation everybody's been having. But right now, since the, the technology and what it's capable of doing is not fully vetted, it's just generally being talked about what's possible, it's difficult to imagine exactly what those tasks are going to be. But we, knew that, we do know there's an increased workload. It's just who's going to provide it and, and manage that. So there's time to ramp up. Yes. Yeah. So really, if you think about it, we're, uh, as we implement NextGen 911 and integrate it to FirstNet, we're creating the problem that we will then have to solve once we're able to receive all that data. Yeah. Wasn't technology supposed to make things more efficient? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Efficiently no, complicated. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, these graphics are available, and uh, one of the reasons why we want to make them publicly available is so you can use them to help educate those organizations that you represent and provide feedback to us if there's things that you think need to be tweaked or added to these diagrams. Please let us know. We would appreciate the feedback. The next graphic talks a little bit about some of the things that Cal OES has been doing uh, in the last, say, nine to ten months. So you remember we did our outreach meetings last summer. Uh, the point of those was that we, we definitely know what we need in California, and we have the data to support it. We then took that data over a 90-day period, and we worked with um, this board and AT&T and FirstNet to receive our final offer letter, which we received on December 20th, and it was deposited in the portal. There were still some gaps that remained in that letter, and so the, um, the, the governor, uh, when he signed the opt-in letter, Director Gerladucci sent an accompanying letter that identified some of those gaps. And so that's really what we're working through this negotiation partnership with AT&T and FirstNet, is to not only support what was in that letter, but also to address those gaps moving forward. And so we've opted in, and, and what opting in means is 
Cal uh, in California, AT&T can now build out band 14, right? Each agency, though, has a decision of whether to subscribe or not subscribe to those services. So it's important to understand that distinction. So in the letter, um, AT&T, and we'll let them talk to it, has, has um, promised hundreds of sites for California. What Cal OES is going to do is work with each county and operational area to identify coverage needs and then communicate that data back to AT&T and FirstNet as to where the needs are. We also are going to be working very hard on site hardening. Uh, this is obviously a process, and so hardening every single site on day one is, is not practical. And so we're going to feed those mission-critical sites. We started with uh, the mission-critical sites that were identified that either support a public safety answering point or some other mission-critical component in the network. And we want to build on that uh, based on local needs of what you say is an area that needs to be hardened. And there could be a variety of reasons for that. But we really need that data from the, the operational areas. And then we'll feed that information back to AT&T and FirstNet so they can, can harden the sites that support that area. Um, we also are in discussions with AT&T and FirstNet about identifying and classifying users. You probably remember during the outreach, there's these two major categories, primary users and extended primary. And there's the ability to move users in priority within the primary and on an incident support basis to uplift an extended primary up to primary. The exact best practices, rules, governing authority, and all that has been left up to the, lo the local agencies, so leaving a gap for someone to coordinate that. And so that's something that we've been discussing in a lot of detail at, at all the outreach meetings. Uh, to the first bullet point um, where you're talking about uh, Cal OES working with the county operational areas to identify the coverage needs, I, I would ask that um, the state partners be also involved in those conversations we, to include CHP, CAL FIRE, Fish and Wildlife, State Parks, to name a few. Yeah, so, so good point. Uh, um, you're, you've probably seen the notices that the, the PISR SPIC is going to be started back up, which is a, um, a body that is all of those agencies that come together. And so we want to use that group to, to leverage to get that information back to us. But if you have data now, certainly you can send it. And we'll probably need to add to our um, support teams of which state agencies they support. So we'll do that as well. So you've got a single point of contact. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And then the, the last bullet on this slide is, is just the, the CGIS and, and COLET certification. We know that's a, a, a local agency responsibility. However, the network used to deliver the data is an important component of that. And so there's some work that needs to be done there as well. So as, as Barb from AT&T mentioned, uh, we were able to identify 30 sites for the year one build. And um, what we did was we took the 571 critical location sites. We took the comments that were received at those outreach meetings. And then we used the data that was gathered in the meeting, because some people submitted a comment uh, via the portal that we had built, and others just submitted it verbally or in writing at the meeting. So we took all that data back to come up with the first 30. Now, obviously, we have 58 counties, so not, not everyone got a site, but this will be an iterative process each year that we go through. And uh, that's really the purpose of the broadband services team within Cal OES, is to help gather and collect this data. Uh, unfortunately, we can't show you the sites because of um, the, the portal restrictions, but they have been selected and, and um, they're in the process of being built. A uh, quick question, Budge. Are these all band class 14 sites? Yes. Thank you. All right. Any other questions on this? That's in addition to the 5,000 or so. Right. Yeah, so there's... The, the way the build-out goes, and, and AT&T has a presentation that I've seen, they do a really good job of describing this, but because it's their data, not ours, um, you know, we can't share it here. So, um, but they're definitely more than happy to meet, meet with you and, and share that for your area, Barry, especially in the, in the Bay Area where you'd be covering. Great, thank you. Yep. So we want to talk a little bit about costs because we know it's important. Um, the first thing to understand is, is that each agency or department um, can, can choose AT&T for their mobile data needs 
or they can select a different provider. And there's nothing, uh, you know, Cal OES or the state is, is or FirstNet or AT has not mandated that you, that you use AT&T for those services. Keep in mind that if you're using a different provider or carrier and you transition over to AT&T and you want to bring your own device, there may be some additional costs there and you'd want to really account for that. The connection requirements that need to happen in your public safety answering point to link FirstNet into NextGen 911, that's an important consideration because you're going to need to link with servers or there may be equipment, firewalls, routers, and other, other components that either your local IT or, or um, you know, through some contract service would have to account for. So just keep that in mind. If you want to get a sense of pricing where we'll end up, the NASBO pricing is out there now today, and you can look at those services. And right now, um, we're working with the California Department of Technology on a state contract to be able to procure those services through a state contract, where we're hoping to negotiate some more favorable pricing uh, would be the goal. And uh, there's obviously the ability within this for agencies to manage their own users, but keep in mind that that management of users is probably a little different than the way you do it today. Today, um, your broadband services are, don't have this priority level. They aren't assigned to incidents. There's some additional capabilities that FirstNet and AT&T are bringing that are included in that management package. So you're really going to want to consider, as a local agency, how do you manage those devices? You know, who's the person that's managing it? Uh, today, it might be done in, in, say, your procurement section or over in your... Uh, uh, billing and, and accounting, and, and it may need a more of an operational input because of the increased capabilities. So it's just something to consider. Each agency will have to work through that detail. Budge? Yeah. Does the NASBO pricing include the AT&T FirstNet services? Yes, the NASBO the pricing does have AT&T FirstNet services okay. on it, and all the buckets and categories are there and data plans, and they're all there. Okay, this next graphic, um, keep in mind, based on negotiations, this timeline might be adjusted, but this is what we've been working toward. Uh, draft language is due back to AT&T by March 19th. We'll then enter into negotiations to whittle down what the, between uh, Cal OES, CDT, and AT&T. And the final version of the contract language we want to have ready by March, and then really the rest of that is the, the, the goal is to put this in, uh, in a contract vehicle, and there's some steps required to do that. And that's why you see uh, if we get this started in the beginning of April, it takes a, about 30 days to get all the forms and, and pieces in place. So that would mean around the beginning of May, these services would be available. So uh, based on the timelines that, that we've been told by AT&T and FirstNet, their core is not available until April. So this timeline it coincides nicely with, uh, with when the robust features are going to be available through AT&T and FirstNet. Any questions on that? Yeah. So at, at some point, I, I hear from several fire chiefs at some point, I hear from several of the fire chiefs' uh, organizations, and one of the things they're looking for is how we're going to communicate some of this information out to them. And I think, um, you know, again, they're, they're looking for us, how we're strategically uh, um, putting this together and uh, sharing that information to where it's going. And, and you know, I think overall, uh, you know, I tell them be patient as we roll FirstNet out uh, as we go down this route, but they are looking... Um, I've had several questions, you know, not only from your last uh, discussion on the build-out, but also on the pricing and how that's all going to come together. So um, just a thought as we work back through that uh, to the first responder community as well as probably the secondary users out there at some point. So, Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, I'm going to skip a couple slides ahead just to answer that question now. So I'll tell you what our outreach plan is, and then I'll come back to these couple of slides. So this graphic right here is included in the package. And so if there's a meeting that you know that is happening, that you want a brief out on where we are, let us know, and, and we can attend. I'm sure AT&T would probably offer the similar service. And that goes to any association uh, represented here. 
if you want us to come and, and share our current status and where we are, just let us know, and we're happy to, to attend those meetings and provide you an update based on what we have. Because this information does change week by week. Absolutely. All right, so I'll go back a couple slides. Um, so we put this together. Um, there's been a lot of questions. What does my agency need to know now? So there's some <laughs> trifold brochures over here on the table as well as a list of questions that we think would be good to, to ask of anyone providing broadband services. And you'll see they're very generic. Um, the goal that, of those documents and of this type of outreach is to make sure that you're educated and that you have the questions in your hand that you need to ask to make sure that the broadband service you're receiving is what you assume you're receiving. Because there's sometimes a mismatch on future capabilities versus what's available now, what the system can do today, and we want to make sure that, that that data is available to you. So that's why we've put together this information, and that's one of the, the goals of the team that we've put together at Cal OES is to help facilitate those questions. The state contract available is, is not available today. I showed you the timeline for that, but um, if there's an urgent need and May is not soon enough, there is always the opportunity to directly engage with AT&T for services prior to May 1st. And so there's nothing precluding an agency for doing that. It might make more sense to wait for the uh, statewide pricing, but um, you know, obviously if there's an urgent need, you, you can en enter into conversations immediately. So our ongoing relationship with AT&T and this partnership, we're going to help uh, work with them to communicate the priorities of new construction and coverage enhancements and site hardening. The data that we receive will communicate back to them. We're going to make sure that the applications are interoperable. We know that we have users across the state on multiple carriers, and it's important for these applications to work regardless of the carrier that you're using. We definitely want to work through the user portal, so as your agency gets services and you get access to that portal if there's gaps or additional information that you'd like to see communicate those back to us and we can we can talk with AT&T and we want to make sure that operational needs and best practices and rules of use are not restricted by system design so we want to mesh those things together and I'm going to talk a little bit about that when I do an update from the SWIC perspective on, on how we're going to accomplish that. So the next slide is really meant to uh, enter into a discussion with the board members. This, what we've listed on this slide is, is the two boards that exist today that have a, a kind of an uh, advisory role to Cal OES, CalFRIN being this board, and the purpose there was uh, to coordinate with FirstNet efforts and really the policies and practices, procedures as this National Public Safety Broadband Network was rolled out and also uh, make some recommendations on any outstanding issues that exist. We also have the California Statewide Interoperability Executive Council, or the CalSeq, and they're a governance structure that oversees primarily interoperability and everything related to interoperability. So you can see how these two boards are kind of, uh, have some overlapping responsibilities. Historically, CalSeq has focused more on land mobile radio and, and this board has focused more on broadband services, but those two spaces are starting to merge together um, because of the tools that are used in incident response. So we just thought we'd kind of plant the seed today, and I'll probably give Pat a chance to say a few words on this, on this board and its role and, and how it works with CalSeq or what that looks like going forward. So we just want to open it up for comments and questions. Yeah, with that, I would like to open it up, you know, to board members who might like to, you know, have some input into how we establish this or, you know, restrictions that you might see or obstacles that you might see in, uh, in moving forward with this. So, Chief? I think it might be helpful to, um, if Budge, if you could briefly give a, describe the membership of the CalSeq. So the CalSeq is broke up into four planning areas, Northern, Southern, Central, and Capital Bay. Each of them is made up primarily of local agencies. However, state agencies also attend those local planning area meetings. So it's not uncommon, obviously, Cal OES, through our communications coordinators, they attend those meetings. And it's not uncommon for someone to, from uh, Parks and Rec or Fish and Wildlife or Cal Fire to attend those at that level as well, NCHP. 
uh, we, we get a, a really good representation. They meet quarterly, each of those planning areas do. Um, they're not funded through any grant activities and there's no uh, funding that, that flows through them. So that you really have folks showing up that have an interest in the region to make sure that interoperable communications are successful. And the meetings usually last an hour or two, depending on which portion of the state you're in. And that CalSeq has to uh, coordinate interoperable channel use for all the interoperable channels statewide. They oversee the California Statewide Communications Interoperability Plan, the CalSkip, and the California Interoperable Field Operations Guide, the Cal IFOG. So those are two documents that they have oversight for interoperable communications statewide. The executive council of that is made up of the chairs of each of the planning areas. And so when there's something at the, the, the CalSeq level that needs to be approved, that chair represents the region. And so it's, it's an ad hoc group. It's not established in statute. And um, the planning areas uh, are all... Uh, the chair and co-chair of each planning area facilitates those meetings. As the SWIC, I serve as an advisory role to each of those boards, and I'm, I'm not a member of any of them. Any of the other board members uh, you know, like to chime in with some thoughts on this? Scott? So I was chair of the Southern Region years ago, um, and uh, it's very heavy LMR, as you said, because that's, that's what we had back then, and we had commercial carriers as our data network. I do see that, uh, you know, LMR and, and LTE are blending in, in the future, and we've, we're telling people today that uh, your, your data network and your LMR network are completely separate, and don't think of them as, as one network today because we don't want people thinking they can replace their LMR radio anytime soon. So I think that you're right, that the, there may be an opportunity to blend these two in the future, but I don't think we're quite there yet. I think we need to still work on... Um, issues with AT&T and issues with broadband policies, procedures, and guidelines in, in, in general. And, uh, and, and maybe there's a way to start introducing some of this to CalSeq to help us with some of those efforts. Yeah, well, I, well, I appreciate that the CalSeq is really focused on LMR. As we move into uh, the deployment of the, the public safety broadband net, some of the same type of coordination responsibilities that we've experienced over the years with LMR are going to be necessary for the broadband system. So that's why we're starting this discussion. Um, clearly staff can go back and you know come up with some thoughts and do kind of a, a brainstorming session to see what kind of steps we could do. And, and we'll certainly bring it back to this board, but we would like to open it up and see if, if uh, you have any input or if you have a staff that would like to participate in this process, we'll be more than happy to uh, accept the contribution. Pat, I'd also like to chime in. It's interesting when you look at the two, I think we also have varying stakeholders, um, and that'll probably be an issue that needs to be addressed because I see FirstNet has a much broader reach as far as stakeholders to address. <coughs> um, and, you know, when we look at things like priority and, and other things, uh, you know, getting to secondary users, I think we need to make sure we're as inclusive as possible and, and ensure we have the right makeup uh, of that governing body. Okay. Any other? Uh, yeah, this is Barry Frazier. Uh, just a couple of initial thoughts off the top of my head. First, with respect to CalFern, uh, you have a number of different potential tasks for us here, and not not really knowing for sure, but it, it sounds like it could be a, a lot of work. And for for a board that only meets once every other month, or or even or quarterly, um, I, I'm not sure whether we need to consider that, the, the level of, of work that's involved in, in our discussion of this, uh, I guess we can always divide up into subcommittees or something like that. Uh, there, that's worked in the past. But I just want just, uh, just seems like that there's quite a bit of, of work involved here and we may need to think about how often we meet or think about how we delegate that. With this respect to CalSeq, my only experience is with the Cap Bay planning group, and the, the, B Budge mentioned that you know these are ad hoc groups, and I think ad hoc is a good way to describe the Cap the Cap Bay group because it hasn't it, it meetings have been infrequent, uh, and the the makeup of the of the groups have uh, you, you know been 
is not is not form is there's no formal structure to it, and my concern <laughs> is that um, uh, I'm I'm just not sure un unless there, there there's some better or more for formal framework put onto these groups that they're going to be very effective, or that some some may be very effective and others others not so much. So uh, I, we just need to consider that as we're thinking about how we divide up this these tasks. Understood. We uh, we do have we have received a funding under a Slig P 2.0 that started uh, March the first to support the you know the OES and 911 branch staff on this. So you know I we would clearly like input you know from the the Kaufman board members and hopefully from those that are on the CalSeq processes as to what they see as issues. I don't really expect. The tremendous amount of staff work that we put into the evaluation and to the no, right. RFP process to, to be duplicated, but you know clearly the you you this board represents a, a wide swath of public safety from throughout the state, and um, you know we clearly like your input and some reviews. So we'll work with staff, you know, to come up with some stuff and present it at the next meeting. And, you know, I clearly don't expect you know a tremendous contribution of your staff time unless you got a lot of time on your hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so going back to what I said about the blend, I think maybe that maybe there's an opportunity for the CalSeq to to be some work, do some work for us, and and slowly we can start handing LTE broadband stuff down that way as we kind of as we kind of manage it and supervise it, and then and then maybe at some point they do ultimately take over completely. But I just think it's a little early uh, right now. And then secondarily, you know, I have a operations committee and a technical committee at LA Ricks that meets regularly for those same kinds of issues, for what you've listed here, policies, procedures, guidelines, SOPs, those kinds of things, trying to adopt uh, some broadband policies, procedures, SOPs for, for the region. And so we would be very much like to help you um, with your efforts here. Well, maybe I can find a way to get down to some of those meetings. Yeah. You know, If you have them on Monday or Friday, I'm really good. Monday. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other uh, comments from the board? Okay, well, we'll work with staff and we'll uh, get in touch with Scott and his team and L.A. Ricks and hopefully come up with some recommendations for your next meeting. All right, so this is uh, the, the last slide on the, the overview. So just really the next steps. Um, the, the team that we've put together at Cal OES, their goal is, is to visit every county, as many operational areas as we can, and really get a list of these top five critical sites and identify where gaps exist in, in site hardening or where needs exist in site hardening because you may not know the status of the cell site that's, that's feeding your particular area. And then feed that information back through Cal OES to make sure that it gets to AT&T and FirstNet. We continue to meet monthly with AT&T. We have quarterly meetings with FirstNet and uh, meetings with the operational areas as I've discussed before. If you have a meeting that you want us to come to, let us know and, and we'll come. I mean, that's, that's really the point. And just by way of notice, the next CalFirm board meeting is, is tentatively scheduled for June 13th, pending everyone's calendar availability, but we want to get that out as far in advance as we can. And uh, this next graphic I've already used before, but we'll just set it there and see if there's any other comments or feedback from the board. Okay, hearing none. Uh I'm sorry, hearing none, we'll move on to a report from Mr. Frazier on the PSAC. Thank you, Pat. Barry Frazier, as most of you know, I am uh, the uh, appointee of a group called NATOA, <coughs> National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors, uh, to the FirstNet Public Safety Advisory Committee. The committee's a, uh, made up of about 44 or so uh, representatives from nationwide associations. Uh, and other other stakeholder groups, uh, we we meet uh, quarterly uh, and then twice a year in person, and we report directly to the FirstNet Board of Directors. And the FirstNet Board basically gives us uh, the t our tasks that that uh, that we we conduct. I have to start out with a kind of a sad announcement. Um, Tom Sorley, who uh, was the uh, recently appointed chair of the uh, of the Public Safety Advisory Committee passed away uh, last month very unexpectedly. Tom was young. Uh, he was actually the director of the Public Safety Radio System for the city of Houston, Texas. 
uh, and also had done a lot of work in, with Nipstick and also uh, had just taken over for Harlan McEwen as, on the, as the chair. Uh, his, uh, his passing away has caused a little bit of, of a delay and reorganization of the PSAC, but uh, they recently announced that Paul Patrick, who is the uh, representative from the National Association of State EMS Officers, uh, has been named the interim chair going forward, and I expect uh, that uh, they will, the FirstNet board will name a permanent chair uh, in, in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, given that, we have done some, some work. Uh, in February, we held a webinar on uh, advanced uh, location-based services for public safety officers. This is not uh, location-based services for 911 calls, but for identifying specifically the location of, of our uh, first responders when they're out in the field. And, and, and most importantly, working on what's called the Z-axis, which is the, uh, the floor of a building on which the per public safety officers might be working. For instance, a firefighter fighting a fire in a multi-story building. Uh, incre uh, incredibly important and critical information, especially for firefighters, but for all public safety officials. And uh, FirstNet provides a great um, vehicle and opportunity for uh, providing uh, more detailed uh, location-based services of our first responders. Uh, we had a very good webinar on some of the challenges and some of the possible solutions for that for that type of of service that, that could roll out uh, uh, eventually over the first net um, network. Um, the we're also having on April 3rd a similar type of webinar on mission critical push to talk, which is another critical application that will be uh, available. Uh, hopefully sometime very soon over FirstNet network. Uh, mission critical push to talk would, would obviously be the, the uh, ability to, to talk via talk groups uh, over the LTE network uh, and also involve some, some elements of, of converging LMR and LTE into a, kind of a unified voice system and uh, we'll be talking about that in more detail on April 3rd. We also have a series of, of calls based that, that are being called feedback calls, which will begin uh, end of April, which uh, the, the FirstNet uh, board will select specific items and will allow the PSAC members to provide feedback on, on uh, uh, how, how those services should be delivered and if they're already being delivered by AT&T, how well they're being delivered and provide some opportunity to provide some real feedback directly back to the board on, on how this service is rolling out. So um, those will be happening April through June. I would actually like to um, work with Pat and Budge to, to send out uh, maybe a follow-up email on this to the board uh, to, pr to provide the opportunity for you to give me feedback of things that you're hearing about the service as it rolls out, and then I can convey that on to, to, the, uh, to the PSAC. Uh, and then finally, our next in-person meeting will be June, first week of June in, uh, in San Diego. It will be part of the PSCR Broadband Stakeholder Summit meetings that are held every year through uh, public safety communications research. And so that's about it for my report. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Otherwise, thank you. Any questions for Barry? Okay, moving on back to Budge for the statewide interoperability coordinator update. So I, I probably should have showed this graphic when you asked the question. Uh, I apologize. I, it's here. Uh, so these, this is an overview of the four planning areas, and it identifies the CalSeq chair. Uh, you'll notice in the, in the center there, the Capitol Bay planning area, we have a meeting coming up on, on March 26th. And the uh, two nominees are up there. There may be more nominees that come in, but that's all we've received so far. Uh, and down in the south, uh, Veronica just recently moved into the chair position and they have a new vice chair. And so that, that deck needs to be updated as well. But this is the planning areas and how they're broke up across the state and uh, the chair and co-chair of each. And so if you want more information on meetings, meeting locations and, and that type of detail, let me know. We can definitely get that to the board. I mentioned the Cal IFOG and the Cal SKIP. Those are the two governance documents that exist that have an overview of interoperability. <laughs> we are in the process of taking the Cal IFOG, the Interoperability Field Operations Guide, and turning that into an electronic version. We've submitted all the data to the contractor and they should have it ready for us by the summer of, of 2018. 
So uh, any of you who have seen the online version, it's available now in, in a PDF form. And this would be an app that you can download to your phone and, and mobile device and search through and find what you're looking for. It includes all of the interoperability channels statewide as well as an overview of every single operational area in the state. And so it's, it's a real handy reference tool. The next document, the statewide communications interoperability plan, we are going to be updating that. I was just approved um, as a technical assistance request, which we get five requests per year from Department of Homeland Security. They usually approve some of them. This year they approved four of my six that I submitted. I always ask for a little more. And, uh, and so one of those is to update the, uh, the CalSkip document. In that document, we would like to include some best practices and operational considerations for broadband services and FirstNet. So I'll send out information to this board on when that CalSkip will be meeting. The last time we did this, we had a meeting in the south and one in the north, and they were linked together via WebEx. There is no call-in option because it gets too confusing when you have 60, 70 people on the phone trying to provide comments on a document that you're modifying on the screen. But if you'd like to participate in this or there's folks from your agencies that want to participate <laughs> in developing the next version of the CalSkip, please let us know. We, we definitely would like for you to participate in the working group. My goal was to have that take place sometime in May or June, but <clears throat> Department of Homeland Security is running the timeline on that, so I have to wait to hear back from them. So we'll see how that moves forward. These are the technical assistance requests that were uh, um, approved. I know this is a lot of detail, <clears throat> but I wanted you to have this information in front of you. So really, this is the takeaway. The electronic version of the IFOG is the first one. There is a tactical interoperable communication plan that they're working on for Northern California, if you're interested in that process. And then, uh, as I said, our 2018 submission has been approved but not started. And these are the ones that are included in the 2018 request. The first one is to work in Southern California and develop an ISSI, which is the inner system subsystem connection that happens between P25 radio systems to establish some common talk plans between P25 systems in Southern California. And we know that there are many P25 radio system users <clears throat> that want to participate in these conversations. So uh, if you're interested in more information on that, uh, let me know and I can get you linked up. Barry, I've got you down as the point of contact on the next one, and that's yep. a COMEL course in the Bay Area. And just, Bud, th this will probably be the easiest one that you have because we've already set up a, a date for the course. We have, I think, 14 people who are, have completed their prerequisites and signed up. Uh, but we have several slots still open, so if there are others uh, in, in the Bay Area or in, in California who want to take advantage of this uh, all-hazards COMEL training, uh, we, we still have some <laughs> slots open. So. All right. And that, uh, that dovetails on to the next one because once you get your COMEL training, you need to have an exercise in order to sign off your task book. And so that was another request we asked um, down in the southern planning area. They have an event that they call the radio rodeo and it occurs in November of 2018 and so we'd like to have a northern version of that where we can link it back to the south and we'll actually get folks from Department of Homeland Security to sign off task books for any COMELs that participate in that training and so that has been approved as well so any questions on the technical assistance requests we had a question online um, could there be a joint committee between the two groups? Between CalSeq and CalFriend, I'm assuming. Yes. I don't see why there couldn't be. I don't see anything precluding that. So when we um, work on a, a governance model and linkage, we can certainly do that. Absolutely. All right. And that's it. That's all I have. Any, any further questions of Budge on the statewide interoperability? Do we have any uh, public comment cards, Paul? Nope. <laughs> Jeanette Kennedy from FirstNet. 
Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jeanette Kennedy from the First Responder Network Authority. Um, I'm sorry I didn't see the list for me to sign in for public comment, but I just wanted to express uh, on behalf of the First Responder Network Authority our appreciation for all the hard work that the CalFern Board put into the outreach and the messaging and the coordination and uh, all the collaboration we had uh, in preparation for the state plan and the governor's decision. Um, you know, we commit to continuing conversations with you and working uh, to make uh, the nationwide public safety broadband network in California a success. And uh, you know, we're confident in our partners with AT&T to be able to deliver um, on their, uh, this network in California and meet the needs of first responders. So, you know, we're obviously open at any time um, to dialogue, to talk, to figure out how to work together to make uh, put this network better in California. So I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jeanette. <clears throat> any other comments uh, from the board before we uh, entertain a motion to close? Yeah, we'll entertain a motion to conclude the meeting. I move to adjourn. Okay, we have a motion to adjourn. We have a second? Second. Okay, without objection, we'll, we're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>